Hey everyone, thank you again for submitting your questions and for joining us for this World Day Against Trafficking panel. As I said yesterday, we covered so much ground with Melanie and Christian that we ended up breaking up the video into four parts. Part one aired yesterday and part two will start now. Before we continue the panel, we just want to continue to bring attention that we are going to be discussing difficult and possibly triggering subjects. Um, the goal here is to have an honest, thoughtful, informative, and worthwhile conversation. So let's get part two of the panel started. We got a lot of questions from some people who have unfortunately experienced rape, trafficking, exploitation. And, and the question was, why me? Why, why was I targeted? And, and this idea of like how a victim is targeted, why a victim is targeted, obviously you guys have very eloquently explained uh, the different psychological tricks that predators play upon you and, and perpetrators knowing exactly what they're doing. We spoke earlier in the conversation about barriers and societal barriers that they prey upon. Um, and, and this does, unfortunately, disproportionately target marginalized communities, people of color, LGBTQ, immigrants. What are some barriers that we don't even necessarily realize that exist that make it easier for certain communities to be targeted? I think the marginalization in, in itself is the barriers that were, I mean, it's out there, but still some people don't take heed to it, you know us coming from poor communities, us being LGBT plus identifying, us being from coming from foster care, going through the foster care system, being homeless, being a runaway youth, um, being undocumented, being an immigrant, struggling with substance abuse disorder, which a lot of people overlook that one. Um, you know, these are all things that are unfortunately very, it's prevalent everywhere, but it's specifically prevalent to individuals that are living marginalized, living in impoverished communities. Um, and it's, it's solely because of that, that we're preyed upon. To those people, those individuals who asked those questions, who, who unfortunately had to experience sexual violence, you know, to them I say like, none of this is your fault. And I know that for myself and many other survivors I know, when we finally exit, at least the first time, the question is always why me? You know, we would say, we don't wish this on anybody else, but why me? What was so special about me that came out? And over the years, as I became an adult, I had to I had to kind of teach myself some things, but I learned that it's because of my vulnerabilities that I it was so I was so easily susceptible to trafficking. It's not because I'm weak, it's not because I'm less than, it's not because I don't possess the ability to do certain things, but it's simply because traffickers are keen at smelling vulnerabilities. I don't know what it is in their heads. I don't know if they all sat in a trafficking training or something, but they literally, they, they are abusers. And because of that, they're keen on recognizing when somebody lacks confidence, when somebody is sitting by themselves, when somebody looks like they're not from here, you can tell just based on what train station you get on or what area you get off in, if they live in a poorer community or not. You can, t like, there's little things that you can tell. And then in, in younger children, um, I, I'm not gonna say it's easier to spot, but it's easier to groom a child and it's easier to, um, uh, I guess, he, like sniff out those vulnerabilities because in children, their reactions to things are very different and very open. With an adult, I can walk through the world and pretend I'm going to work and, and hide it better than a child can. But a child will start acting out in classrooms or be absent a lot or cry for no reason. And there's a lot of things that children can't control. So traffickers can sniff that out in a heartbeat. But it's never, it was, it's never anything that any of us that have gone through this, even if it, was, if, if it was rape or trafficking, whatever, it's nothing that we've done it just so happens that because we live in a society where marginalization exists and we just happen to be a part of that population, we're easier to target than somebody who lives in privilege and has a bigger support system or more connections to people in higher places or more money to bail themselves out if anything were to happen. So it's easier to target someone who can't afford or don't have these resources put in place. For sure, and I think mm -hmm. when a community is marginalized, uh, we don't, and we spoke a little bit, Christian, with you about this in, in one of our conversations, which is as a society, we often don't care about something unless it directly affects us. 
-hmm. and, and the thing is, yes, it is easier to target marginalized communities, but that doesn't mean that you're any less susceptible as a human being this happening to you, because you're absolutely right, it's not your fault. And these perpetrators are masters at what they do, um, but we don't speak about it because we don't have a direct uh, experience with it. Yes, it is so true. And I, and I just want to take a moment to say to all those survivors who have experienced any form of abuse, exploitation, or violence, that remember that you didn't do any harm for real. Trust me, you didn't do any harm. Like you're a human being, you're allowed to feel, you're allowed to love, but remember who did the harm, the perpetrators, the abusers, the traffickers, and the buyers. They are the ones who are doing the harms. Sadly, you were vulnerable. And remember also that we are living in a society. It's not that you were born vulnerable. Society loves like all this stigma and discrimination. And I think so that is that the last component about barriers. Those are the things that are exposing us. Those are the things that are making us vulnerable as communities. Because sometimes we don't realize how stigma and discrimination affects so many people. In my case, for example, I am an immigrant, I'm HIV positive, and I am a gay man. So I have suffered from xenophobia, homophobia, like a lot of discrimination because the way I look, because the way I speak, because my accent, a lot of things. So can you imagine like just arriving here and being vulnerable, like in a new country, in a new space with no one around you? Like how easy it is for traffickers to exploit that? How easy it is for traffickers like to identify those needs? And, and, and of course, those are needs because we're human beings, you know? Like we have feelings, like we want to feel like that we are protected, that we, that we have a support system, that people are believing in us. And as you say, Vanessa, sometimes we fail to achieve that as a society, as a community. Like we don't care, like, like literally, like I think so that even when we see something in the street and, and we see people like engaged in prostitution, we always blame them. We always say like, but they are the ones who choose to be there. And, and I'm always thinking about myself, like, what about if that person experiences xenophobia, transphobia, homelessness, like they are not able to work, like, how, how how can we continue blaming all these people? Like, no, we really need to approach this and start like to understand what are the real barriers. Because if as a society and as a communities, we don't destroy those barriers, those barriers are, every single barrier is an opportunity for a trafficker, for real, every single barrier. Mm -hmm. and, and we know that as a human beings, we have different barriers. It doesn't matter your color, your race, your sexuality, your gender, your gender, expression, your country or origin. There are barriers out there. And if we don't find a way to go through those barriers, traffickers, I use them, are going to use them and are going to continue exploiting people. And I just wanted to add really quickly because Christian made a really, really great point. Um, but I wanted to add that when we have those questions of why me, I wanna tell everybody that when it comes to trafficking and prostitution as a system and exploitation as a system, then I need them to understand that us being targeted is less about us as people and more about them viewing this as a business. It has nothing to do with you as Melanie, you as Vanessa, you as Christian, you as Laura. It has to do with in their minds, this is a business and it's about power and control. And I think that it took me years to get out of that mindset of what's wrong with me was it something I said, something I wore, something I, some way that I looked, a facial expression, and had to realize that they didn't care. My trafficker didn't care about Melanie the person. He didn't care about hurting Melanie's feelings. He cared about putting somebody under his control for his benefit. So I think that you know, to to any to all survivors of sexual violence, it's always about that person's issues, that person's power, need for power and control, that person's sense of entitlement, that trafficker's need for business or money or whatever have you. It has nothing to do with us as people. It's more about their what their goals are and they don't care who they hurt in the process to reach that goal. Wonderfully said. Yeah, we definitely have covered this 100%. Um, but I did wanna shout one of the questions that we got from Yasmin, who is from New York. She did her AP research project about sexual exploitation. Yes, Yasmin, 
Uh, so she says, do you believe that victims of certain religions or ethnicities are more susceptible to be victims of sexual exploitation? And does that impact the likelihood of coming forward? Definitely am reiterating, like it happens to anyone. So your religion per se is not the specific factor that stops or, or makes you more susceptible to trafficking. It could happen to anyone of any ethnicity, religion, or creed. Um, I will say that when it comes to a survivor of exploitation specifically, um, it's hard for us to come forward, period, because of the way that, for many reasons, honestly, the way the cops respond, people don't believe you, people feel like it, it was your choice, people feel like you did this. Um, however, I do recognize that certain religions, more than others, are a lot stricter when it comes to um, anything re re relating to sexual violence and, and, and in some cultures and some religions, anything relating to women and girls. And I think, you know, this feeds into another question that we got anonymously that we're really focusing on here, which again, it's like, it's not your fault. There are barriers that these predators feed upon, whether it be your religion, whether it be your marginalized community, whether it just be them watching you and seeing that you're an easy target for X, Y, and Z reason. Um, we got a question about how do we get more awareness to missing and exploited sex trafficked black children? There's barely any coverage pertaining to them or any children of color. And I think this is another barrier, which is the idea that there is not enough coverage on certain communities when this happens. Therefore, why is someone going to believe you? Why is someone going to care? That is a tape recorder that, that can happen in, in someone's head very realistically. So I'm, I'm going to let you speak, Christian, but I had to jump on this because this ties into a larger issue of systemic racism. And that translates and disperses itself all through the media, journalism, everything that have you, any big corporation, Hollywood. So in order for us to get the message out on for Black children in a mass way and in, in mass communications way, the, the racism systemically has to be uh, addressed and dis like disbarred, I guess, um, from the top down. So I think the only thing that we can do until we address that huge oppression is to, in our individual capacities, spread the word and spread awareness. And if you have connections to places um, that do have access to mass media or mass communication, getting the word out on those platforms. But as long as society doesn't care about black children or black people or still views black people as inferior they're not going to cover it the same way they're going to cover britney you know that everybody you know bl blonde hair blue eyed britney like they're not going to cover that so it's hard because they, the reason there's no coverage is because we're not considered at the top of the food chain like everybody else we are not equal like everybody else to majority of society and the people that are running the mass communications are people on that side of the fence so i think that it's just a matter of us as the minorities trying to do the groundwork and working with our allies that in, in trying to you know spread the word as, as vastly as possible yeah it is so true and i and i uh, um, add on melanie's point is is the same happening with immigrants you know because i have been seeing so much xenophobia you know like but they are not citizens like who cares like all the kids all the kids children that are disappearing like like when they are crossing like the borders and all these things people who are immigrants who are disappearing who are getting murdered and literally like because of racism xenophobia and all these things like we literally we don't care and you know on top of that if you are like black or brown or lgbt it's like if we don't care because of this plus being LGBT plus being of color plus being black plus being immigrant like we don't care at all about you and this is the sad thing that that's why we continue like black people brown people LGBT people immigrant that's why we continue being vulnerable because it's like we are not enough as human beings and and because of all the systems that are out there like okay if and I don't like to say it but if white people are are not being trafficked, we are not going to pay attention. And it's like, and, and well, this is happening to LGBT people. This is happening to immigrants. This is happening to black people. This is happening like in our communities and we are not paying attention. We are not talking about this. Like, so that means that we are done enough and that literally like the people, the 
government, the communities, like they are yelling at us. We don't care about what you're experiencing. We don't care about your pain and we don't care about what you, what you have suffered. It's, it's so true. And I think it's something as a society we have to face and address head on. Um, and it, of course, as you were saying, Melanie, it falls into an even, an even deeper issue as well. Um, but yeah, it, it breaks my heart and it breaks my heart to have people feel that they, you know, aren't worthy of the coverage or aren't worthy of um, being a part of the conversation. It's, it sucks. Christian um, said it, and it's like being all of those barriers and then additionally being someone in exploitation just yeah. makes that barrier, that, that margin drop all the way to the bottom which is why so many survivors aren't believed, which is why so many survivors get abused by authorities that they're supposed to be entrusting in, by police officers, law enforcement, things like that. So it's just barriers all around at this point. Yeah. And, yes. and again, it's, um, we've talked uh, about this a bunch, but I want to kind of get into it. We've used kind of the word insidious when it comes to trafficking, which I would very much agree with, but I want to get into an even more insidious form, which is online sexual exploitation. Um, so, you know, we discussed, and Vanessa and I actually kind of like did a bit of research, and we found like in the U.S. I'm going to look down. Sex trafficking is legally defined as the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, obtaining, patronizing, or soliciting of a person for the purposes of a commercial sex act in which the commercial sex act is performed by someone who is not 18 years of age or a person of any age is induced to perform by force, fraud, or coercion. Um, so there's a very strict legal definition of sex trafficking, but when we get into exploitation, it gets a little bit murkier. Yeah, so specifically online sexual exploitation, there is no legal definition for in the US or internationally. So when there's no legal definition for something that makes coordination, collaboration, and combating it extremely difficult. And going back to barriers, because of this, predators and traffickers can prey upon people so much easier. They're open to a whole new world of ways to target potential victims. Um, Melanie, you spoke about this at the UN, which is, what are some of the ways that predators target people online? Oh, there's so many. Um, and it, it really depends on the age group. So for adults online, for the most part, they were exploited as children. There are some people who were exploited after 18. Their first encounter with um, exploitation was after 18. Um, but online, what you find is places like backpage.com, craigslist.org, those types of websites where you uh, directly and explicitly um, list ads uh, for sexual services. However, there are other things like social media um, that literally target children um, more so than, they, than it targets adults. Um, there's a lot of high schools and middle schoolers that use things like TikTok and Snapchat and Facebook and Instagram where you get random unsolicited DMs or messages that are trying to recruit you. So that social media is definitely a major tool that is definitely on the rise since places like backpage.com and so have shut down. Um, but then there's also this other component of online, well, online and in person, but online gaming um, that a lot of people tend to overlook. Um, so there are a lot of things, especially during quarantine, now that everybody's home, there are a lot of chat rooms and live games where you can go into these random chat rooms as you're playing a video game and chat with strangers who are also playing this video game. Omegle is probably one of the, the more modern ones that a lot of people use, but there's so many more that I, that I can just get a list for. Um, but in such chat rooms, a lot of predators um, whether it be traffickers or pedophiles or whatever have you, go into these rooms and do the same as they would do on social media. They try to recruit children by um, going back to this grooming process, trying to bond with them over something that they like, i.e. video games. Um, starting, it starts with one time you swipe in a chat room, you're with this random stranger, you guys are talking about the game, and then you go back tomorrow and you play the same game and that guy comes back. 
and that person comes back. And then over time, you don't know, a month has gone by with you conversing with this person. Not to mention a lot of these predators also have either themselves or have access to hackers. So a lot of times they get a lot of your personal information or they're hacking your camera so they're watching you as you're playing this game and you, even if you're not in the chat room with them. So there are so many ways that people use video games and social media and the internet to, um, to recruit and to further perpetuate the sex trade. And, I, and that's why I, I love to emphasize the role of technology in the internet because it provides such anonymity, not only to sex buyers, but to these predators um, without you know, raising any direct and obvious red flags and a lot of them use this and video games as a way to perpetuate the grooming process. So I think that we need to, um, parents take, <laughs> take as much precaution, especially with video games, because you know, at first people were taking precautions on social media, um, Facebook has like Facebook kids and YouTube has YouTube kids and there are all these censorships, but a lot of parents and a lot of people are not thinking about how video games are playing this role, not to mention, things like Grand Theft Auto, video games like Grand Theft Auto, where there's literally explicit prostitution in the video game. You go around, you drive, you blow things up, you, you run into cars and you pick up women and you say, this is, this is what you're gonna do for me. So there are so many different innuendos that are hidden in these video gaming platforms that a lot of people tend to overlook. And a lot of um, chat rooms and abusers and traffickers that are, that are recruiting kids directly from these sites because they know parents aren't necessarily paying attention to you the entire time you're playing the game. Yes, it is true. I just want to add that, that, that it's really good that Melanie is creating awareness about that because I'm a gamer. And I was thinking about that because during the quarantine, I have been playing more and suddenly you're playing one game and you receive a message like, oh, how can I beat this boss or all these things, right? And suddenly, and you can receive like, the audios and you can chat with them. And most of the people that reached me out, they were kids. They, they were, I, I could tell that they were between like 10 and 14, 15. And of course I was helping them, but immediately came to my mind, like there's nothing, there is nothing stopping traffickers and exploiters to start grooming these people because literally kids or people who are playing are like, can you help me? That is a door open, like for traffickers and explorers, like a condition like, yes, I can help you in exchange of what? Are you coming and play with me like every day at this time? And you know, you are starting conditioning kids oh, for real. I was, I was so afraid and I was trying to look like, is there an age restriction on the chat? Is there a way that I can just stop receiving messages for kids? Because even for me, it's, it's a weird dynamic, like receiving like messaging for kids. Like I'm playing like, and I'm playing like games that are supposed to be like for 15 years and older or 18 years and older. And I'm receiving messages for kids that are definitely like younger than that. And I'm like, literally, this is a gate open to help for real. Like, so if parents are, are looking at this, like, please. And it's not about like, come and say like, don't play games anymore. It's about like, trusting you with your kids like you know what like this can happen to you online like be careful about the people who are you playing with what they are asking you if they ask you your thing like you know that you can always ask to me and all this thing. i think so that that is our best to create awareness about this and not just jump randomly about like you're not going to play games anymore because they are going to find a way to do it to so play. i think so that creating this trust with them is the way that we are going to solve traffickers online um, especially on gaming at the end of the day all the conversation in general and specifically always has to be from a parent and a kid, a conversation of trust. Yes, yes. It's not a conversation of like, you know, we did um, a few like kind of like screenings for Saving Zoe and we, we did have kind of um, uh, like a Q and A after and this parent said, obviously with like the best intentions uh, possible, but it was just like, you know, I'm just going to kind of like ban social media for my for my team and just do that and we were like no that's like probably the worst thing you could do because it just exactly what you said it opens up a door of distrust and and the team not communicating and not having a conversation with their parent um and that's the exact opposite of what should be happening no conversation is i think key to this and, and it, it is not often talked about it's an 
awkward conversation between children and parents. But I think what you said, Christian, the idea of like, hey, if anyone is approaching you, you let me know. If anyone is offering you anything, you know, going back to the conversation we were just having about vulnerability and we we're talking about, you know, emotional vulnerability or societal vulnerabilities, a vulnerability is, hey, can you help me win this game? 110% because automatically you're in a position where, where you need that person. And it's in a small way, but it can grow. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know what? Oh, especially now that gaming is online, you know that you can buy bots, that you can buy weapon, that you can buy DLCs, like all all the things that you can sell. And um, you know, if if you don't, if your parents or you don't have like the economics like to buy things online, it's going to be super easy for a buyer, for an exploiter, for a perpetrator to say like. Oh, do you want to play with me? Actually, I can buy you this thing, like the VIP mm -hmm. membership and all these things. You know what? There, there's an exchange. That's why I think so that we need to extend our our definition about what is exploitation and especially what is grooming. Because with things online, oh my god, like we can receive gifts from strangers. We can receive and not only physical things. You know, you, we, we can receive things, books, like movies, like memberships. Like, what about if I don't have Netflix, Hulu, or any streaming service, and somebody, a random, someone in the, I post, like, things like, oh, I would love to have, like, Netflix to watch movies, and someone around me, oh, I know that, you know what, I'm giving free memberships, like, I also cross game in another, just one point. There was another example, which is slightly separate from that, but I knew somebody who, um, got recruited through through a game chat and what ended up happening was um they're playing the game with this person this is somebody that they've developed this virtual bond with because it's the same username that they're seeing every day when they play the game and then this was when they were a child but that person goes from i'm kind of sick of this game do you want to play a new game and the person says yes and he says okay here's a link to this new game click the link now you've opened the virtual world of porn if you want to win the game, you have to send me this, send me this picture, send me this gift, send me this virtual credit for whatever the games are, send me whatever, whatever. And it's easy to recruit really like younger, younger children in that way that are completely oblivious. And a lot of times what I'm noticing is that in um, uh, adolescents and like young preteens and, and early teenagers, a lot of them don't, are not necessarily, I'm not going to say they're all alone, but a lot of them are not super close with their parents or are often in their own rooms and distant because they're on the game all day for hours at a time and because of that a lot of parents don't recognize that they've been building this relationship with this entity on the other side of the game so i actually had to had to check my younger brothers because now they're into the video game chat rooms live streaming and i said oh no we're gonna have this conversation because it's it's really and with Omegle specifically, you swipe the screen and it goes to a next random person. So you never know who you're gonna get. And with that sometimes comes unsolicited pictures, unsolicited videos, people saying things. So I think we really need to, I don't think that gaming is the largest percentage of recruitment. Like the largest percentage of recruitment doesn't necessarily come from these platforms, but it is on the rise, especially that now everything is online. And because now of COVID and quarantine and all these things, um, people are, are, the usage has gone up. And I think that we're not paying enough attention to this. Parents, children, sisters, brothers, we all need to look at that and really monitor what's happening on these games because the games are not censored in, in and of themselves. So we really need to pay attention to that. Yeah, and again, I think it falls under the conversation of even just talking about what online sexual exploitation is and what that, what that encompasses. So, which is actually a perfect segue into a question that we got. Uh, it, this is Lisette from Ecuador asked, and I think it's a really important question, is revenge porn considered online sexual exploitation? And I know Vanessa and I became educated about this specifically from Saving Zoe, but what would you guys say to answer that? Not directly. Um, however, it is exploited, if, if that makes sense. So usually exploitation is for the purposes of something, whether it's money, whether it's in exchange for something. So a lot of times with revenge porn, the person that is being exploited in those photos is not receiving anything and there's no exchange 
per se. However, that's it, it falls under so many other things when it comes to sexual violence. It's definitely defamation of character at the very least. Um, um, rape at the very least. Um, it's non-consensual. So it doesn't necessarily fall under the, the exploitative side of that exchange of a good service or money, but it is exploitative. Um, and, there are, and there are a lot of people who, um, excuse me, revenge porn easily becomes sexual exploitation once it's sold to somebody else. So if you're uploading revenge porn or, or videos or pictures of your partner that you took without their permission onto this site, it's disgusting, but it's under revenge porn. It's under sexual violence and being violated. However, people will, sorry, people will take those videos or those photos and then resell them to people on the dark web that want those videos. People, and that's when it becomes exploitation because now there's an exchange of money or profit or Bitcoin or whatever for these images and for these videos. And I think this goes back into what we talked about where there is no legal definition for online sexual exploitation and where this starts to get very cloudy um, because uh, we know uh, that, we know through working with certain organizations that online sexual exploitation can include grooming, live streaming, consuming child sex abuse material, also known as child porn, coercing or blackmailing for sexual purposes, which is known as sextortion, and, and sharing of non-consensual sexual images, which can be revenge porn. And the idea of something being uploaded without your consent can right. be a crime. And, and I think there's a lot of confusion about that uh, when you did consent to possibly the photo or the video to begin with, but when it is placed online without your permission, gotcha. that's when we're crossing into a territory of something being illegal. And I haven't seen, like you said, that direct definition on for online sex like exploitation, but in, in my previous panels and conversations regarding revenge porn, what I hear them tend to do is separate online sex exploitation from cyber sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And then revenge porn comes up. So it's definitely a great area. We do need to work on getting a very concrete definition of online sex trafficking under sex trafficking. Um, but I've heard that more with, with sexual violence and cyber sexual abuse more than I have with sex exploitation. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes. Oh, go ahead. Yes, and I just want to highlight that, especially for boys and men who are watching like this conversation, stop soliciting or stop sharing with your friends like videos, pictures, because at the end of the day, we don't know how, how you got or how your friend got those pictures. We don't know if your friend coerced that person, if your, if your friend forced that person, if your friend drug that person we don't know we don't even know how those pictures those videos any kind of media thing that stop sharing them you know because we don't know like probably, what about if they are being raped constantly and all these things and you are sharing them because of, of you think it's it's manly and it's going to make it better like to be honest that that it doesn't make sense uh, you you need to take care about others, you need to worry about others and uh, where all these things are coming from, you know? Like, right. especially if this is free, like what makes you think that this is not coming for exploiting one person or, or, or somebody who didn't want to do this and, and did it because of uh, a place to stay, a meal or something like that. Like, right. for real, boys and males who are watching like this video, stop doing that. Like, like, this is not cool. This is not progressive. This is not something that is going to make you more men. Like, no, not a lot, like, like for real, no. We need to respect one each other, like 100%. I love that. Thank you so much for watching part two. Part three of the panel will be posted tomorrow.